tambourine and a ten-stringed instrument. Hallelujah. Amen. And that, that means you and I can defeat a whole army of people. Hallelujah. Amen. And that's how powerful this little, this little thing is. The demons hate this thing. See if there's any demons out here. <laughs> they hate this thing. Hallelujah. But God loves it. Amen. In fact, uh, remember when God took the children of Israel across the Red Sea? What did the lady, what did Miriam and the, and the women do? They danced on the other side. And they, they, they took the timbrel that was called the timbrel or the tambourine and they, they did their thing. They danced the victory dance. Hallelujah. So uh, never know when we're going to break out. In fact, what I'm going to do with the tambourine like this, I'm going to put lights in it. Different color lights like the uh, priest wore in the, in the breastplate. The different colors, the different gems I'm going to put in the side here. And I'm going to try to find some kind of uh, lights that flash out like that, you know. And I'm going to do a dance, and I'll turn out the lights. And uh, it'll just shine. It'll flash out like that. And then the demons will hate it more. <laughs> and we'll just have a good time. Hallelujah. Amen. So uh, I thought I'd share that with you. Praise God. Good to have my main and only squeeze with me tonight. I said, I, I, I called her my main squeeze, and she said, you, I better be your only squeeze. <laughs> Why don't you come up and, and greet the people, honey? It's my wife of 37 wonderful years. Almost 37. 37 in August. Amen. She's my lover. She's my friend. She's my companion and, and uh, co-labor in the gospel. Well, good evening, everybody. It's great to be here, to see all of you. It's been a little while since I've been here. But you're like my family. And it's been a while, but it's like yesterday. And I just love all of you. And... Good to see you. <laughs> and uh, we'll be here for a few days, and we'll be seeing more of you. And excited to see what, what the Lord's going to be doing in these, these coming months. It's neat to hear about Friday night. We'll be sure to be here, even if we have to buy earplugs from Kevin. I tell you, he never misses one, does he? Go sell them. <laughs> yeah. But, it, you know, every time we come, there's something new. you got your river of life ministry sign out in front that wasn't there last time I was here it looks great and you know just new things all the time and see some new faces and and I'll be looking forward to meeting everybody and knowing the new people so. amen yes hallelujah praise God he that findeth a wife findeth a good thing Praise God. And finds favor of the Lord. So I'm favored from the Lord by having my wife. Praise God. Love her. Amen. Oh, yes. Hallelujah. Ah, let's turn to uh, Genesis 12. Praise God. Now, some of the things that I've been into lately uh, in the Word is um, has to do with the coming age. You know, how many know that we're in the middle? Kind of, we're in the transition between between ages right now. We're 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 moving from one into the other. You know, from one millennium into another millennium, and we're in a in a in a corridor in there that God is is going to make some many many transitions. And uh, it, we, we better be ready for it. We better be ready for it. Because God's going to lift us up a little higher. In fact, He's going to lift up a, a, a lot higher. And to get us ready for what's coming in the next, uh, the next age. I'm really anticipating great things from the Lord. 
in the next seven years. And uh, one, one of these things has to do with the priesthood and the intercession. Intercession in the priesthood. And uh, what that means, that, that uh, God has called us to be priests. A priesthood. How many know that? I mean, are you people of the Word? Do you know the Word tonight? I mean, I know some of you are. I don't know some of you. But so I, I want to be sure that you understand what I'm talking about. You know, uh, some people hear words, but they don't hear, they just hear words on what they're used to hearing, and if it's something different, they kind of amp out on you. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so they, they trip out, and they move out, and then you've got to grab their mind and bring it back and say, here, here's where we're at now, so they have something to, 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 to hear. And uh, I believe it's important to communicate, and if I'm say, if what I, if I'm communicating an elephant, you're not you're not hearing a monkey. Sometimes that happens. We've all got to be we've got to be in the same line. We've got to be tuned into the same station. So I'm going to trust God that uh, the Holy Spirit teaches us tonight some things that will bless and that will lift us up. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for your presence, and I honor you tonight, and I've come in Jesus' name, and I ask you to speak through me tonight, and Lord, I ask that there be no confusion, that we are speaking, and what's coming out of this mouth, and what is being heard in the ear of faith is the same message. And Lord, I thank you, Father, that you brought us into order, that, you brought, that you're bringing us into all truth. And Holy Spirit, I give this meeting to, over to you, that you use and flow through this vessel as a river of life. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Genesis 12. When we talk about the promise, we talk about God's purposes, we go back to the very roots. And uh, the roots as we know it, we who are in Christ, our roots, the roots of the nation of God, the Bible calls us a holy nation, the roots of uh, the covenant of God, and where it began is with uh, Abraham. Abraham. It goes back to Abraham and the covenant that God made with Abraham. Because he promised Abraham that his seed would be as the stars of the sky and the sand of the sea. And he said that, uh, that, he, would, uh, that he would make him a blessing wherever he went. And that in him would all the nations of the earth be blessed. And he promised him a seed... A seed, a singular seed, which, who was Jesus? Jesus, in Galatians 3, is, is spoken of as the seed of Abraham. And we're in Christ, so we are, we are the seed also of Abraham. And so whatever Abraham is involved with, and whatever promises is given to Abraham, is given to us. Not in any less measure. Not in any less major, measure, but in the same measure that God promised it unto Abraham, He promises it unto His seed. And that's you and I. That we're in the picture. And that's what our faith must say. Our faith must agree with what God says. And be united to what God says. By our faith. You see, that's why the, the children of Israel did not enter into the rest of God. Because... Their faith did not unite them with the promise of God. And we must be united. We must be united to the message and that we must be totally identified with that message in that that message and us become one. Become one. You must be one with your message. You must be one with your message. And, it must, and then the Word becomes flesh. 
Then the word begins, it clothes itself with your flesh, just like Jesus was clothed. The Spirit of God, the Son, the Word was clothed with the man Jesus Christ. God wants to clothe His Word with you. That His Word and you are one. That your movements is one. Here comes the Word. There it is right here, just walking. The Word has to start walking in your shoes. <laughs> Amen. And then you, then you will have real authority. See, the devil knows whether you have authority or not. He knows whether you really mean what you're saying or you're just going through motions. And what God, God wants us to, to uh, that the faith that he's given to us unites us with his word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's go back to uh, Genesis 12. It says, Now the Lord said to Abram, his name was Abram at that time, and God changed his name to Abraham. He said, get you out of your country from your own, from your kindred, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. In order to receive and to move into your identity in Jesus Christ, many times you have to move out of that which is familiar to you in the flesh. And what people continually and want to tell you you are and what you're not. You have to move out. Now, you have to move out, move out more than just in the body. Sometimes you can move out physically, but still have that in your mind and in your emotions. You can continue to live in the, the effects of that familiar that familiar those words and those feelings of the land that you came out of. And uh, these are, you have to understand that these are the things that are hindering you from fully entering in to becoming identified with God and His family. Because He is separate from your history, you see. Because your history died with Christ. Your history died with Christ. And therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Not a renewed old person or a patched up Adam or a patched up sinner. You are a new creation. That's who you are. You are a new creation. You're his workmanship, the Bible says, created in Christ Jesus unto good works that has been that has been prepared before that you should walk in them. In other words, you're a new creation with a new purpose. A new mentality. And that you've been made after the image of the one who created you. You're not even part of that old person. That old person is not even part of you. Now, the residue within your mind and in your emotion and in your will must be renewed. You must be renewed. And those old imaginations has to be cast down and cast out. And you must be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be not conformed to what the world and who the world has said you were and are, but re be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you might be transformed by the renewing of that mind. Those old fears, doubts, were just that old program that keeps buzzing around in your brain that keeps bringing you down. It keeps robbing you of your victories. I mean, you can't even rejoice over a victory without the old, those old thoughts coming in and trying to rob you immediately of the, of the rejoicing of that victory. How many how many's ever, I mean, you've, when's the last time that you really salivated, or you, you, you just rejoiced and you just, you just was, it was just so delicious that you couldn't, 
you know, in, in some victory, in, in something that God has brought to you, and that you just, it was entirely wonderful, and you just rejoiced in it. Just think about it. And immediately the enemy tries to come and rob you of that, doesn't he? Tarnish it in some way. Just kind of take the edge off. The edge of joy just comes off. You know, and, and if he can do that, then he can kind of down your heart and you become less effective. Because every victory means a defeat for him up ahead. So, so his, his dimensions are in the dimensions of time, in Adam's time. And he has to get you into that time mode where you're not living in faith anymore. You're living by your own experience, your own circumstances, and how you relate to those circumstances. And as long as he can keep you in that mode, he can keep you from being free in the victory that Christ has provided for you in eternity. Hallelujah. Amen. All right, now, we've got to come out. He says, get out of your father's house. Get out of it. Get out of it in your mind. Get out of it in your emotions. Get out of it in your will. Now, I'm not, down, I'm not bad-mouthing your dad. Bad-mouthing your dad. I'm saying with what residue is in your life that is from the old and from the familiar in the flesh, we must come out of that land into a land that God will show us. Okay? Hallelujah. Are you with me? Praise the Lord. Okay, let's go on. He said, to a land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you. The land that God wants to take us to is a land of blessing. He wants to bless us. God wants to bless us. God wants to bless you. The Bible says God will withhold no good thing from them that walk uprightly. And it's His good pleasure to bless us. It's His good pleasure. The Bible says that it's pleasurable in the eyes of the Lord to prosper His people. When His people prosper, He's delighted in that. So this is God's heart towards us. One of peace, one of prosperity, one of health, one of blessing. That is ours. That is ours. That's what Christ has provided for us. The Bible said that He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And He's blessed us with all things that pertain to life, all things that pertain to to life and godliness. In other words, He's already purchased the land of promise for us. See, Now what He's provided for, He says, go in and walk in it. Become identified with it. Because He told Abraham, He said, I want you to walk the land and every place that your foot shall tread is yours. Walk through the land. Walk through the land. Now there's different land that's to be possessed. The land of our own soul. Have we really possessed our souls? Have we walked through the land of our, with our intellect and our emotions and our wills and have we possessed them for the kingdom of God? Or are they... Keep, are, are they uh, a wilderness. Is, are we living in an emotional wilderness? Or is our will, are we people that vacillate? We can't make a decision. We vacillate. Well, I don't know. Maybe this and maybe that. We become double-minded. We have no volition. We have no strength of will. And the devil comes along in one little thing and we're off on a tangent. That's what we call an emotional wilderness. That's not the land of promise. That's not the land of promise. God wants to give you your soul as a land. 
He wants to give you your intellect, your mind, your will, and your emotion to be yours. To live in freedom and in strength and in power. That's God's will. That's God's will. So he says, I want to make, uh, I'm going to make your name great. Now he was talking to Abraham, but he's also talking to us. He says, I'm going to make your name great. He's going to make your name great. Now what, what's your name? Your name is what you represent. And who, you're, who you represent. And you should be a blessing. And I will bless those that bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, that is, that's a promise given to Abraham. But it's no less a promise that is ours because we are his seed. We are in his family. And that's who he, God was promising. He was promising everything in the loins of Abraham. He was blessing everyone in the loins of Abraham. Even Levi paid tithes in Abraham. <laughs> That's what the Bible says. Before the law was given. See? Some people say tithing is of the law. Abraham paid tithes, so did Levi. But Levi was in the loins. And when Abraham paid tithes, Levi did too. <laughs> See, when, when Adam sinned, so did we, because we were in the loins of Adam. But when Christ obeyed and died upon the cross and resurrected from the dead, so did we, <laughs> because we were in his loins. <laughs> we were in Christ. Huh? You see? So we live not after the fashion of the old man. We live after the fashion of the new man. That's created in righteousness after the image of him that created him. A new man. A new man. A blessing wherever we go. What a mentality. You show up on the scene at work and you say in your heart, because they may not understand, a blessing is here. I have arisen. Now, you may think, oh, that's pride. No, it isn't. Not if you're saying it in truth. Because you know who provided it for you. You know who provided you for it. And it's not of your own work or righteousness or it's not of your own work. But you must be identified with the truth. And the devil will say, oh, that's pride. That's a lie. Because he don't know what pride, because he's one with pride. So how can he accuse you of being proud? The devil does not accuse you, you see, of something that's not of himself. He can't. Because he can't, he can't tell who you are in Jesus because he has no part in that. He's, a, he's of darkness. He's the prince of darkness. And you live in the light. So what has fellowship with light and darkness? If he mentioned anything about the light, he'd have to flee, wouldn't he? <laughs> right? Hallelujah. So, uh, wherever you go, you're to be a blessing. If you work for a company, that company is blessed because you're there. Your family is blessed because you're... They may not recognize this. But that's the truth anyway. In fact, if we weren't here as a church, there, couldn't, there wouldn't have been any businesses upon the face of the globe. Because the only reason why God is keeping this, a lot, this thing going and allowing it to go and allowing those loan companies to exist is because you're still here. That's the truth. He'd just burn the wicked up right now. 
if there were no more righteous here, just like he did with Sodom and Gomorrah. But there's more than 50 righteous here. So he has mercy on them. And he allows the nation's bank to continue. After it's changed its name a dozen times. And he allows the wicked to continue. Because this is all they have. Because the church is here. The salt of the earth is preserving the world. And maybe a few of them will come to Jesus. And they provide work for you. So you can be a blessing to them. See? So uh, wherever you go, whatever you do, you're to go with that understanding that you are one with the blessing, the promised blessing that God says you are. And so th that is uh, the key to ministry. That's the key to ministry. Because wherever you go, the covenant of God goes with you. And the covenant of God that he made with Jesus Christ when he offered him up upon the brazen altar of the cross and his blood was shed for those in whom you have to do. And you can be a blessing. You can love them without them loving you. You can love them and you can speak well of them and you can do good to them, even those who would do evil to you. You can still do good to them. And you can overcome evil with good. Why? Because you're not your own. And you're there as a messenger of the cross. You're there as a messenger of redemption and reconciliation. You're there in Christ's stead. Because He's given you a new name, hasn't He? Hallelujah. Amen. You're not there in your name now. You're there in His name. So you can love and you can say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They have no... They're just like I used to be. See? All of us were there, weren't we? But then Jesus came. Hallelujah. Amen. So we're a priesthood. A priesthood is one who does intercession. Now, God called Israel to be a priesthood. Let's go to Exodus 19. I want to be kind to you tonight and give you a good word and send you home refreshed and not worn out. So we're not going to be lengthy tonight. So you can relax. <laughs> Hallelujah. Exodus 19. So, is he just getting started? How many verses is he going to go? He's just got started with three verses and he preached a half hour and a three. My goodness. What if he had five? I could preach all night on what we just, what we just, uh, <coughs> Exodus 19, 5. It says, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me. A special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Now, this was given, first of all, to natural Israel, to the natural seed of Abraham. This was, they were to be a special treasure. They were to be above, above all peoples of the earth. Not because they were so good or because they were many in number, but because of God's choice. You're here because of God's choice. Not because you're that cool. Not because you... You know, you do everything right, and you're, so, and you're so much more righteous in yourself than those that are out there. You're not. But because of God's choice, He said, I've chosen you and ordained you to go and bring forth fruit. Fruit unto me. He said, I've made you a special treasure. I've put you above all the people because all the earth is mine. And you shall be, a, to me, a kingdom of priests. That's who you are now. 
But you will be manifested in the age to come as a kingdom of priests. Because your priesthood is not of the same priesthood and the same order that was uh, after the uh, order of Aaron, which was a shadow of a priesthood to come. The priesthood to come is the one that is called after the order of Melchizedek, who is the king of peace, who was a king and who was a priest. And Jesus Christ is the great high priest of that order, and that we are the priests upon the earth and the kings upon the earth that shall intercede and bring the nations into the kingdom of God. But we have received the kingdom first. It says, You shall be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the children of Israel. Now, let's go to over to uh, First Peter, or Second Peter, I'm sorry. Now, that was given to the Israel after the flesh. Now we're going to look at the church. And Peter speaks to the church. 1 Peter 2, 1 Peter 2, and the fourth verse. It says, Come to, Coming to him, Jesus, as a living stone. Now, this stone is not a stone like a rock. In other words, just a, what, what we would look at as a stone. It is a gem. And what we're talking about living stones, we're not talking about stones like likes up there. Those are stones. Those are dead stones. Those are stones that are not living. But I'm looking at stones that are living. But this, these stones are stones that are gems. Because if you'd open up this earth suit, like that, there'd be glorious light that would come out in the form like a diamond or like a ruby that the light shines through and sparkles and comes forth. And you find those in the, in the wall of the New Jerusalem. And, this, it, and it was made up by the priests. And in Nehemiah, Nehemiah, who built the wall in Nehemiah? The priesthood built the wall. You read it. The priesthood built the wall. But in Revelations, the wall was built by <laughs> the priesthood, but it was made out of them. You read it. And it was represented in the in the uh, in the the the, the uh, 12 apostles of the lamb. And the wall and the gate the gates were made of pearl and they represented the 12 tribes the 12 sons of Israel. So that represents the old and the new covenant. And a rem actually a remnant of both, which makes up the bride of Christ. Remember when the angel took John up and he says, he went up on a high mountain and he said, let me show you the lamb's wife. Well, the lamb's wife and the lamb's bride is the same. I mean, you don't have a different wife and you do a bride, right? Hopefully not. I mean, the one who's going to be your bride better be your wife. Your main squeeze, that's right. And he said, let me show you. And, 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 and he says, then I saw a, the new Jerusalem coming out of heaven. And a lot of us picture in our mind a, a bunch of buildings, you know, on a big wall. No, it's made of people. <laughs> people. You are the wall. The priesthood is the wall. Now, we can go through the scriptures. I can show you these things. But look, look uh, just read the, 
19, 20, 21st chapter of Revelation. You don't have to look at your charts and all that. Just look at it and ask God's Spirit to teach you. <laughs> Let Him show you some things. He says, coming to Him a living stone, that's Jesus, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. A precious stone. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house. A spiritual house. A holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices accepted to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion the chief cornerstone, elect and precious. Now, the cornerstone was the, the stone that the rest of the wall or the rest of the temple or the building was measured by. And guess who that was? The Lord Jesus Christ. He's what, every, he's what the rest of the stones are measured by. He's the only true judge. You can't measure yourself by yourself. You, you can only be measured by Jesus Christ. He's the only true judge. He is the judge of the earth. Because he purchased the earth for himself. He purchased you and I. He purchased us and purchased our lives with his blood. And he who believes on him will not be, by no means be put to shame. Will not be disappointed. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumbled, speaking of Israel after the flesh, being disobedient to the Word to which they were appointed. The Word to which they were appointed. Now what was the Word that they were appointed? That they would be a holy nation, a peculiar people, that they would be the royal priesthood, that they would be uh, above all the peoples of the earth. That was the Word that they were appointed. They became disobedient because the Bible says in Hebrews 4 that their faith did not unite them with the word that they were appointed that came to them. And any promise, we must be united to that word to which we are appointed. Some, every one of us has been appointed a word to be a, have a place in the body of Christ. To have, uh, to have a purpose in the body of Christ. To have movement and action, mobility in the body of Christ. We're appointed to that. And it's with the blood of Jesus our appointment has been purchased. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? It's more than, than you coming and listening to a preacher. But it's you becoming involved in God's kingdom. And involved in the work of the Lord. And given to the work of the Lord. And given and having stewardship of the kingdom of God. And stewardship of the lost that He's appointed us to be witnesses unto. And it be a stewardship of the city. And a stewardship of God's purposes within the city of St. Louis. A stewardship in the nation of the United States. And a stewardship of the world. That's what God is looking for. A heart that will be united to His own heart when He looks upon the nations that was purchased by the blood, the precious blood of His Son, Jesus Christ, and the heart of God going out. And He's saying, Who shall I send? Who will go for me? And who will stand in the gap? And who will intercede? And who will... Who will stand in my presence for those that are lost and those that are afflicted and those that are dying? Who will stand in the gap? Who will be my priesthood? Who will, 
take upon themselves the appointment. That's what God's looking for. They stumbled over the rock and the rock that was meant to measure them, that they were to live by, that their lives were to be fashioned after, became a stumbling stone and a rock of offense. Offended at the very rock that was to measure their life and to cause them to be stable, they stumbled over it. So many times we stumble over the word that was meant to save us and to bring us into stability. And yet we become offended and walk out the door when it gets too close to the flesh that we preserve and that we hold on to. Say, I want this. This part of me is not coming out. It's not going. I'm not going to give this to the Lord. So the preacher comes too close and we run and we run to another church. It might be a little easier. And then we hear something again. And then we run here and we run there. But God wants us to be planted in His house. That we would be called the planting of the Lord. The planting. How can we be the planting of the Lord if we don't stay long enough to be planted? And to be rooted and grounded in the body of Christ. Where we can be perfected. And as the, the, you know, the stone roller. You know what those... The, the, you know how they shine stones and the tumblers? We're in the tumbler in the, in the church, in the local church. We're in the tumbler. And, and, and we, perf- we knock off the rough, rough edges, don't we, with one another. But it doesn't take that much to offend, and we're out the door, you know, and I don't know, I know people don't, don't, you know, and that person didn't smile at me, and they're mad at me, and all this trip, you know. That's the old house. Still talking. It's the old mind, the old jingle-jangle mind. (laughs) And we never get stable. We never get planted. We never get rooted. We never get grounded. And we never never begin to move in in God's calling. And, And when Jesus, when we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, there's no excuses. There's no sin. Well, my husband this and my wife that and my kids, you know, they didn't, they wouldn't sit still in church and I couldn't come to No, 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 no. That's going to go out the window. You know, God's going to say, what have you done with what I have done for you? What have you done with my son? What have you done with the blood that was shed for your life, for your time in eternity? What have you done? What have you done? How have you united yourself to my plan? Have you even considered it? That there's a plan beyond what you're experiencing? (laughs) Do you suppose there is? Or do we have it all? I mean, do we, are we really experiencing what we believe is the fullness of God's plan right now? Oh, it's an ever-increasing one. It's, an ever, it's something that, that continues to grow with us. But we have to yield ourselves. We have to yield ourselves to the stone, to the rock. You know, I, I, I got a kick. I, it just came to me just the other day. You know the song that says, he took me out of the Mari clay and put me my feet on the wall? And I said, the Mari clay, Mari clay, Mari clay. Well, that's the nature of Adam. He was made out of clay, and it's Mari. You know, I always, I always saw somebody stuck in the mud. But he brought us out of the Mari clay, out of the flesh, out of the flesh of Adam. The old flesh is made out of, and, and set us upon a rock. Isn't that neat? never thought of it. It just came to me the other day. The old Mari Clay. What is the Mari Clay? The Mari Clay is that old nature. He took us out of the Mari Clay and that which is, you know, that is, that is uh, corruptible and put us upon the rock. And not only that, but he made us a rock. He made us a stone in his house. A living stone. One that has mobility. One that had action. Hallelujah. It's wonderful, isn't it? He says, but you are a chosen generation. Talking to the church, you have, you've been chosen. You're a chosen generation. A royal, kingly priesthood. Priest of the hood. A holy nation. 
His own special people. Doesn't it sound like Exodus 19? That you should proclaim the praises of Him who have called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Who, knew, who once were not a people, speaking of the Gentile church, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now has obtained mercy. Hallelujah. So He's brought us into the priesthood. He's made us a priesthood. He's made us a stone, a brilliant stone in His wall. And He's getting us ready. He's getting us ready. He's getting us ready to culminate an age. To culminate an age. And you know, people are thinking about, oh, how is it going to happen? How, how is Jesus going to come? When is Jesus going to come? So forth and so on. It's going to be more glorious than any of, any of us ever even imagined. God's going to pull something that's just going to blow everybody's mind. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know the thing that Abraham had that was counted for him for righteousness. What was it? He believed God. Which is faith. Now let, me, let me ask you something. What was the correction? What did Jesus say mostly when the disciples muffed it or because they didn't, something didn't happen, they couldn't cast out the devil or they walk on water or they couldn't calm the, 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 the sea or they couldn't do certain things. What did he say? Oh, ye of little faith, or because of your unbelief. And you know what? That's why we don't live. The major reason why we don't live in the heritage that God has provided for us. Because of our unbelief. And uh, I believe this, that it's because we go about it after the old man, after the old mind. We don't really know what faith is. Now, I'm going to share with you just a few scriptures and a little touch. And maybe I'll be able to come back some other time and finish it up for you. But it has to do with our place and bringing things from, in, from, from the heavenlies where Christ has provided everything we need into this realm that here that we're living in. And I'm, I'm going to just go and I'm going to just share just a few scriptures with you and then I'm through. Let's go to, first of all, let's go to Mark 11. And uh, before we can be an effective priest, an effective intercessor, we must understand this fully. And I don't believe the church really fully understands it. Uh, we've, ha we've heard messages upon it. And then the enemy uh, has come uh, along with certain slogans and scorned that message. And that's the word of faith message. And sometimes we call it, name it and claim it. That is from the devil. That very, those very words are from the devil. Because it's a scorn of believing and accepting the promises of God. And then some people will put on this, blab it and grab it. Have you ever heard that? And we laugh about it. But you know what? That's a scorn against God's word and God's promises and people that hold on to the word of God. That's not right. And it's the way the, the, the devil will rob God's people of a truth. Now, true, there are people that go way beyond and go into presumption and, and go into different trips on, on things that, uh, the things of God. But that doesn't nullify God's Word and God's truth. That doesn't take away from God's truth. And so we can't 
mock the Word of God and expect to live in it and expect to be uh, moving in the Holy Spirit. So if we, if, any, if, if we are persuaded this way, we need to repent. I don't care what people do with it. What, has God, what God has said is true, regardless of what people do with it. And we should never mock or we should never demean groups of people that believe certain things that are of the Word. They might even take it to extremes, but if, they, but if it's the Word of God, we need to uphold that Word as being true and not ever making fun of people who believe God's Word. Never do that. I say that because I've heard it. I haven't heard it out of any of you. But I have heard it in different persuasions of people, you know. Blab it and grab it. And these people and those people and those people. Oh, yeah, that's those people. That's not, that's not God. That's not God. Oh, those are the laughers. Yeah, they're laughing. You know, never make fun of what God may be doing in the Spirit. Never make fun of people, of the move of God's Spirit. Never, never criticize or ridicule those things. If you don't understand it, just leave it alone. You know, and, and have honor for God's Spirit, the move of God's Spirit. Because you don't know all of God's Spirit. You know the, why Samson was, was opened himself up to the enemy is because God's people, God, his own elders bound his hands because they didn't understand his anointing. They didn't understand that God had anointed him to beat up people. Nobody had ever been anointed to do that before. I mean, who else in the Bible, man, could kill a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of an ass? Who else? Samson's on the way. God even had him marry a Philistine woman. And we say, no, that's not church. Couldn't be, blah, blah, blah. Yes, it was. And his parents didn't understand what God was doing. So... Be careful how you judge matters. That what, what you're judging may be something from the Lord. And you may not, just not understand it. Amen. Okay, Mark 11 says this. This is after Jesus, uh, you remember he, uh, he cursed the fig tree. And he said, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. Those were words. Those were living, powerful words that he spoke to a tree. What we would call an inanimate object. But Jesus knew that tree. And he spoke to that tree like he'd speak to a person. And he said, nobody's going to eat fruit of you anymore. He even spoke to clouds and rain and storms. And he says, cease Peace be still. Because His Word was the creative Word that could that everything stood at attention to. Everything in heaven and earth, every created thing, because He was the Creator. And when the Creator speaks, things happen. How many know that? Okay. All right, stay with me now. Then after he cursed the fig tree, he went in where the fig tree was meeting, in the temple. (laughs) (coughs) He went in and and they were selling and they were bartering and they were going through things, uh, money changers. They were right in the temple, and it angered him. They were merchandising the people. They were selling them doves and different things that they could offer, and they were adding to the price of it, and they were dealing under the table, and they were had false balances, and he saw all this going on, and he said, and he got angry. He did. He got angry. God... Jesus Christ got angry, and he made him a cat of nine tails, and, he, he, and, and those things are really wicked things. And he went in, and he whipped those dudes right out of the temple. He overturned the table. He just went wild in that thing. And then, and the message that he gave them was that my house 
must be a house of prayer to all nations, and you've made it a den of thieves. I'd like to add to that. If the house is not a house of prayer, it is a den of thieves. Because we're robbing the people if it's not a house of prayer. And then the chief uh, priests and the, fair, and the scribes, they heard it and they wanted to destroy him because they feared him. Because all the people were astonished at his teachings and when evening came, he went out. Now in the morning, as they passed by, they saw that the fig tree had dried up from the roots. Be sure when you curse something, and when you speak to something, deal with the roots of it. If there's something growing in your life, just don't cut the top off. But if you're going to cast it down, then get it at the very roots. So that there's no more life in it. And it don't crop up again on you. Deal with things, but deal with them from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed, it has withered away. So Jesus answered them, and he said, have faith in God. Have faith in God. And uh, I've heard, I, I didn't look it up in the Greek, but some said that that means have the faith of God. Which any faith that you have that comes from God is the faith of God anyway. So... That's what Jesus said, have faith in God. For assuredly I say unto you, whosoever shall say to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believe that those things he says, he says, will come to pass. He will have whatever he says. Now, being united to the Word. This is what I'm talking about when we talk about being united to the Word that you've been appointed to. You have to be united to, to what you say so that what you say, you expect to come to pass. In other words, you have. this is what faith is. See, the world gets a hold of things like this. There's time involved in it. I, when I see it, I'll believe it. I will not believe it until I have it. But we do that. We think in times and space where our prayers are merely wishful thinking. Well, I wish I had that, and God, will you, will you do this for me? God, can I have this? Or, God, uh, I'm believing you for this. Or we verbalize things to God that has time involved with it in your own heart. And that makes room for doubt. And that's not the way faith is apprehended. That's not faith. And I believe that what, a lot that we call faith as believers, as believers, believing in God, is not real faith. That's why we don't see what we need to see. The Bible says in Hebrews 11, it says, faith is, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. And that word hope means what? Those of you that were in the last revival that we had in, in January. It means expect, expectation. Hope means expectation. 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 Hope is not maybe. Hope is sitting on the edge of your seat anticipating the answer. Now, the Bible says faith is the substance. Now, that substance is what we must be living in. 
That is the reality of our life. Believing is receiving. You receive at the time or at the moment of belief. There's no time. And your walk from that point must be walking in the reality of the substance called faith. The just shall live, shall live, the just shall live by faith, live by the substance of the belief at the moment of conception there is a baby not when it's born at the moment that life that 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 egg and that sperm comes together you have a child when that word and that faith faith is like the egg the word is like the sperm Sperm enters into the egg and you have a conception. That is the substance of things we hope for. The baby is the hope. That's what you're hoping for. Now your hope is not seen until nine days later, right? <laughs> but you live in the substance. Or rather the substance lives in you until the baby comes, until the substance comes forth and is manifested. Is that true? You carry that baby. You carry that baby until the appointed time. But the baby was always there. And you were living. That substance was living in you. And you were living in that substance. That substance was you. It was united to you. It was part of you. From the moment of conception. From the moment of belief, that was belief. The moment of conception is the moment of belief. Now, different promises have different appointed times. Abraham believed God. Twenty years later, Isaac was born. It took twenty years in the womb of Abraham for Isaac to be born. But what did he do? He lived in that substance. He lived in that promise. He lived in that reality like it was already his. That's the difference between... See, say, uh, the world says, I don't have it until I see it, until it's in my possession. Faith says, I have it in my possession. I'm living in the reality of it. And uh, that hope does not disappoint It will be mine. Because it is mine. And it will come forth in its appointment. But, as, but I'm carrying it unto its appointment. I'm carrying the seed unto 30, 60, and 100 fold. I'm carrying it until I see it. Until it's, until it's manifested. But it's mine. It's part of me. It's, I'm one with that promise. If God told you you'd have a new car. Now this is... This is... Maybe a low level, but people that, that, that need a car, it's important, right? Do you think, God's in, uh, do you think God's, God uh, uh, wants you to have a car? Do you think God is involved in cars? Why, well, certainly. Do you think God might want you to have a new car? Do you think He would have anything against you having a new car? Do you think there's any glory in chugging along in a, in a you know, bang, bang, water, what is that, uh, clatter, clatter, bang, bang? No. <laughs> I'm thinking about the Bardol commercial. Anywhere, anyway, the clatter, clatter, you know. Do you think there's... But see, we must understand, first of all, that it is God's will that you have a new car. You have to know that. See, Jesus said, whatsoever thing you desire when you pray. 
you see. We're involved in the 20th century. They didn't have, they had, I mean, he might be talking about a donkey, a new donkey. Now we're going to have a new, we're believing for a new donkey now. That means that you're pregnant with a new donkey. I mean, you're, you're believing it. it. It's something that you're united to. You might, you might, you know, you have, you, you, you see it. You understand that God does want you to have this for his own glory and for your enjoyment. God delights to give. It's his joy to give us things that we would enjoy. And so, the Bible says when you, when you believe, when you stand praying, you believe that whatsoever you say will come to pass. Now, what if you really did believe everything that you said would come to pass? First of all, we would have to form our words with some discretion, wouldn't we? The Bible said, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracle of God. That means that if any man speak, let him speak as the mouthpiece of God. In Jeremiah, it said, if you will separate from me the precious and the vile, you'll be my mouth. How many would like to be the mouth of God? That's a great responsibility. That would be a great stewardship, wouldn't it? But you would have to, there'd have to be a separation in here. There'd have to be a moving out of the Father's house. The old Father's house. That have to be moving into a land that would be unfamiliar. Because you'd be speaking for God. You speak for God? But when those words are sanctified in your mouth, those words of so much truth that can destroy or it can build up. Then you would have to take upon the stewardship of the wisdom in the very heart of God, the compassion of God, the mercy of God, because with the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Your heart would have to have, it would have to be renewed, wouldn't it? Your motivations, your agendas, everything has to change for you to speak for God. But, it, but as you begin to deal in the small things, then God begins to increase your faith. So you begin to deal with people, individuals. You be de- begin to deal with families. You begin to deal with towns. Maybe little boroughs, little towns. Then you begin to deal with cities and then large cities and then nations and then the world. You begin to deal. You begin to intercede. You begin to have word that will move nations. Because you're not speaking for yourself anymore. You're speaking for the Almighty. You're speaking as an oracle of God. And pretty soon your mouth has power in it. Because you are moving in the integrity of a word that is not your own anymore. It's His. So the things that you used to think were important are not, no longer, they're way down on the list now. Pretty soon you're moving into the ranks of those that move nations, those that move cities. And when you come into town, the demons tremble. Principalities and powers alerted somebody's in town that all of heaven recognizes and earth recognizes don't you when Daniel was praying everybody recognized it and the king trembled they tried to shut his mouth why because he had power with God I'm talking about a priesthood now that's pretty powerful I'm talking about an order that is living in the substance and not in the shadow. I'm talking about an order 
that is after the order of Melchizedek that mediates a power of an indestructible life. I'm talking about the power of God. But faith, everything that you have, that's why the Bible said without faith it's impossible to please God. For they that come to God must believe that He is and that He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Without faith it's impossible to please Him. That's one thing you must have to please God. Now we're talking about the faith that says, Whatsoever thing you say, you shall have. The things that come out of your mouth are just as real, more real than the things that you can see with your eye. At the moment it comes out of your mouth. We're talking about faith now. Faith is the substance of things expected. You live in that reality until you see it manifest, until it comes into manifestation. Well, you do. When you have a baby, when do you name the baby? A lot of people name the baby before it was, you know, when it's two months in the womb, maybe. And you already plan, you, you plan this room. And guys, you know, they'll go out and buy a ball glove, you know. It might be a girl, you know, but they're having faith. I mean, they're going to say, uh, my son's going to have a ball. He's going to be a baseball player. We either paint the, the room in pink or we paint it in blue. We, we put uh, uh, boy things or girl things or whatever. We're already planning that thing. We're already planning for the birth. We're already planning for the manifestation. That's faith. Let me ask you this. The things that you believe in God for, are you planning for the manifestation? If you're planning for the manifestation, good chances are you've got faith that's going to bring it about. But if you're not planning for the manifestation, if you're not living in the reality of what you're believing, now, chances are that thing is not, you're aborting that thing. God says, my soul has no pleasure in them that draw back. But to going on. Are you getting a tinge of faith? Are you, is this coming through? Okay, I'm just going to finish reading this and then I'm through. <laughs> Glory to God. Okay, for as much... I say unto you, whosoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. But believe that those things he says will come to pass. But believe those things that he says will come to pass. That's what you, you have to believe what you're saying is going to come to pass. Elijah said, it's not going to rain until I say it's going to rain. That's what Elijah said. It's not going to rain for three and a half years. And then when it rains, it'll be when I say it's going to rain. That's what he said. See, the Word of God was in his mouth. Absolute. He will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say unto you, whatsoever things, whatsoever things, Whatsoever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them. When? When do we believe we receive them? When we ask, right? Glory to God. And you will have them. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Isn't that great? Doesn't that frost you? Glory to God. That's good, isn't it? Amen. 
Amen. Get your house in order. Get your mouth in order. Know what you want. So you can ask believing. If you don't know what you want, you can't ask for anything. (laughs) See? And the Bible said it's God that worketh in us, what? Both to will, to will, and to do. His good pleasure. You can bank on that. You can take that to the bank. <laughs> you don't have to be in this. Well, I wonder if it's God's will. I wonder this. I wonder that. See, indecision. Indecision. Wishy-washy. Well, I don't know. Maybe. And, and, and doubt not in your heart. And doubt not whatsoever. 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 How, how many times does he have to say it? Whatsoever. Whatsoever. He desires when he prays, believes that he receives it, and he shall have it. We're so worried about, well, I don't know whether God really wants me to... Do you suppose he wants you to have something? Oh, God, here's a guy, you know, God created the universe planets, solar systems, a God that is is abundant, plenteous, plenteous, and gave it all into the hands of Adam. And he blew it, but now he's given, he's put it into the hands of the man, Jesus Christ which is the head of our body and the head of a new creation in whom we are. His own son. God loves us like he does his own son because we are his sons and daughters. Do you suppose he might want us to have something? When he's provided all things for us? He'll work out the heart of the matter. You be believing Him. That's what He wants. Without faith, it's impossible. When you come to God, believe that that He's a rewarder of, of you that diligently seek Him. Diligently seek Him. And if you don't think He's a rewarder, then you don't have any faith. Because He's looking to be a rewarder. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. I'm excited about Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Anybody have a need tonight? Okay. I'd like to pray tonight for anyone that has need of... uh, what promise? Let me ask you this. What promise? Is that real? No. It is real, but it's not a, actually a growing flower. <laughs> Amen. I'd like to pray and believe and agree. The Bible said if two or three, if any two of you agree concerning anything on earth, that's, that's a big picture, you know. Anything on earth, if we agree on it, it shall be done. And I'd like to agree with you on the thing that you want. What do you want? What do you want from God? If you could ask anything that you wanted, anything that you want, what would you ask for? What's nearest to your heart? There are a bunch of things, but there's a priority. There's something that you want. I want to agree with you for that.
Let's stand together. Hallelujah. I'd like you to come up and just form right here. It won't take long. I've been saying that all night, haven't I? Long is just a segment of time when we say long. But really, we're children of eternity. We have all the time in the world. (laughs) I believe God wants to break some yokes off of people. You know, heaviness. Heavy things, things that bow us down. There's no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. There's nothing will he withhold. No good thing. I want you to do this. I want you. Where's my oil man? Come up here, oil man. Oh, that's right. He is. Well, you can fish, man. Uh, he's out there throwing in the pole, but he's sitting down doing that. So we'll just let Pastor Kevin be the oil man today. We'll, we'll, we'll have him substitute. Hallelujah. Susie, would you come up here with me? Hallelujah. Jesus, we thank you tonight for your promises. Lord, that you're preparing a priesthood. You're preparing a priesthood. An anointed people to show forth your praises, to show forth your glories. We must be exercised in faith. We must know the elements of faith. We must have that faith that pleases you. So Lord, tonight, as we hold up those things that is whatsoever whatsoever we ask when we pray we believe that we receive and we shall have at the moment that we agree when we stand praying we believe that we receive and we thank you for it conception is made we give you glory Lord hallelujah thank you Jesus hallelujah hallelujah I thank you Lord for a new day in your mind I want you to take those that that thing that God has put in your heart is the thing that you're believing for right now. The first, the prayer, the prayer that we're going to agree on. When my hand touches your head, when I make a point of contact, then that's my agreement with you. And we believe that we receive at that moment. Just like a baby, just like a conception of the Word of God and your faith. Hallelujah. A new day, sir, a new day is coming. A new day is, at this moment, a new day. And I thank you, Father, that for this prayer, this very thing that he is asking for at this time, this important thing, this very critical thing, Lord, I thank you that it shall be At this moment, it shall be in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name, I agree with him right now. In Jesus' name. A new day. A new day now. A new day. That's what I see. A new day. A new day. A new day. 
a new day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I see. I see a reconciliation. I see a, a, a new day. I see a new relationship. I see a new thing. Hallelujah. A new thing.
is living in us. He is our hope and glory. He is Christ in you. The hope of glory. Christ the hope of things to come. Christ, right now, that prayer is holding up there. As I pray, I put my hand on your head. Living in our hearts. He is our hope of glory. He's a hope of glory. Yeah. He is a hope. He is a hope. He is a joy. He is a strength. He is a light. He is a light. He is a hope. My soon coming King is my Lord, my Maker, my Redeemer. He's my hope of glory.